Hi, everyone. Um, this is Eliza Berry, Marketing Director of Richie May Technology Solutions. And I just wanted to say um, thank you to everyone for coming out to our webinar. Obviously, you're probably going to be attending maybe more webinars than you usually do um, during the current quarantine. But um, we're going to be talking about a topic that you know is, is relevant always, uh, ransomware and phishing business email compromise actually might be more relevant now than ever um, with, with people working from home and maybe not being able to reach out to IT, IT teams as easily and things like that. Um, just a couple of administrative things. We are recording this webinar. Uh, you will get the uh, recording and the slides, um, whether you're attending now, live now or not. Feel free to forward those on to anyone in your organization who um, you know, may be able to benefit from the information there. And um, we, we do keep it available on our YouTube channel um, in perpetuity. So you'll be able to access it anytime you need it. Um, we also will have uh, uh, the opportunity to ask some questions at the end. I usually hang out for about 15 minutes after the webinar. So if you're slow typing or anything, we will get to that. Um, throughout the webinar, you can ask questions in the question panel too. If I can't answer it, I will pose it to JT, our speaker at the end, so that he can get to it. Um, and you can do that in either the questions panel or the chat. I'll monitor both of those. Um, so as I said, our topic today is ransomware and phishing um, for mortgage companies. And our speaker today is going to be JT Gaetto. He's our director of uh, the Executive Director of Cybersecurity Services here at Richie May. Um, and uh, he's very familiar with remediating all kinds of issues from ransomware attacks, uh, from solving them after they happen to preventing them from happening in the first place. So um, go ahead and take it away, JT. And thanks again for everyone for signing on. Th thanks for that, Eliza. And, and thanks everybody for joining today. <clears throat> I know uh, everybody's worlds have been uh, a little turned upside down in, in many areas of the country. And so, uh, again, appreciate you taking the time. Um, just jumping into this, uh, many of you guys are very familiar with Richie May as a firm, um, but we're from a, our technology solutions practice uh, is a, a comprehensive practice. And we not only address areas uh, as it relates to cybersecurity, um, but also areas such as uh, you know, helping with your marketing technology portfolio, business intelligence and forecasting uh, and helping you manage your platform in the cloud, which um, while we're not, not a point of topic for today's conversation, um, many organizations are now looking at that as their workforces are being more distributed. Um, <clears throat> there's my uh, beautiful marketing picture uh, and my name for those of you that don't know me. Um, and, and with that, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the state of cybersecurity. And I know, for many of you that have talked to me before, this is a topic uh, that, that comes up quite frequently. Um, but the the one of the things that I like pointing out is that the financial services sector uh, is the, the the third largest sector impacted by these cyber breaches and these cyber attacks. Um, and and a lot of that is driven and focused on mid market companies uh, such as uh, mortgage uh, uh, originators. And and the reason for that is that we as, as uh, industry do not have the size, we're not at the size and complexity um, that some of the money center banks are. Um, and so that's why the bad guys target us. And when you look at uh, the recent report from the FBI, uh, the IC3 uh, group there, which is uh, a, a task force designated within the FBI uh, to track cybersecurity threats uh, in 2019, there were a little over 2,000 organizations that were hit with uh, ransomware specifically uh, in the United States. And so the, the, we're seeing this trend increase and it and is a very impactful increase overall. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, mid-market companies are really that sweet spot for um, the, the, the bad guys because again, uh, we're, we're really trying to catch up and get to a maturity level similar to some of the other larger organizations uh, in the financial services industry. And some interesting things there is that a survey of 400 mid-market companies that were, that had um, uh, just the ability to talk about cybersecurity, 
nearly half of them had a security incident in the last 12 months that impacted their productivity. And when we start looking at ransomware and business email compromise and some of those other types of issues, those are directly uh, uh, incidents that would in impact your productivity. <clears throat> um, and what's interesting is that 65% of those companies um, had, that, that had also had a security incident during the last 12 months, uh, and, and a third of those incidents were due to the adoption of new technology, such as cloud computing. And so when you uh, think back last year, which seems so far away now, uh, but, but Capital One had an incident uh, in relation to their utilization of uh, Amazon AWS services. And that was because of some misconfigurations on their part. Now, there were a lot of other things that happened in relation to that incident. But many of these, these breaches that we're seeing is that people are adopting technologies and they're not necessarily uh, uh, integrating them into their uh, businesses uh, utilizing uh, industry best practices. But you know, overall, it's all well and good, but where are these threats coming from? And as, as, an, as, as companies grow, um, the, the, the biggest piece is, is that uh, these attacks are looking at the people. It's not the technology stack that's failing us so much as uh, the bad guys convincing people uh, to take actions that aren't in their best interest, uh, especially when it's related to uh, you know, things that are going on in, in the world, right? So right now we're seeing an increased trend of the bad guys sending in phishing emails related to the coronavirus. Uh, and, and with that, <clears throat> it creates a sense of urgency for someone to click on a link or take an action that's not in their best interest. Um, you starting in 2018, phishing was the most common initial point of compromise for, for organizations. And, and that trends continue through 2019 and continues into uh, 2020. <clears throat> so the first type of attack I'd like to talk about is ransomware. And you know, for, for many of you, you're very familiar with what ransomware is, but for those that aren't, you know, ransomware is a, t uh, is a, is a type of malware that is installed on your computer and, and it's designed to lock you out of your computing resources. And you know, think of it functionally as the bad guys walking in, uh, closing and locking your cash register and, and holding the cash register itself that you utilize to run your business ransom and, and saying, hey, if you pay us X number of dollars, we'll give you the cash register back and you can run your business again. <clears throat> and this has been a trend uh, that has been hitting the media and in the spotlight quite a bit in the last couple of years, but it actually started way back in the 80s. Um, but, but today with uh, cryptocurrency and the ability to transfer funds uh, in a much more fluid nature uh, electronically is really uh, up the game for the bad guys. And so in 2019, we saw a massive increase in, in ransomware attacks. And that's, that's really where they, they've started leveraging that traditional phishing element, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the number one uh, method of compromise. Um, and, and then leveraging that, that phishing campaign to either have someone click a link, uh, install a piece of software, or take some other action. And starting in June of last year, especially in the mortgage industry, uh, we started seeing an upward trend of the industry itself being targeted. And there, there are a number of organizations that there were headlines uh, related to uh, them being compromised and paying large sums up, up to $1.6 million. Um, but there are a lot of other organizations that, that have, uh, haven't hit the headlines. And <clears throat> up, up to just the tail end of last month, there are 21 mortgage banks that we've known of directly that have been hit by ransomware. Uh, and either reached out to us for, for remediation help uh, or, or just general uh, feedback on how the incident went. And the average cost of these, these attacks is around 130K. And that, that, that does mirror uh, similar stats that we're seeing from the FBI and other organizations. Yes, there are some very large outliers there. And, and typically those larger outliers are driven by, you know, the size of the complexity of their, their, their company. Um, but overall, in 2019, we saw an increase, uh, almost 80% increase uh, over 2018 
uh, in, in ransomware attacks. And, and what the, the reason in theory and why that, that is, is that that mirrors uh, the, the, the valuation of Bitcoin. So if, if we think all the way back to 2017, uh, as, as you see here on this graph, ransomware was taken off in 2017 and you know, Bitcoin was taken off and it, 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 the, the market fell out a little bit there in the cryptocurrency market. And so the bad guys shifted gears on how they were making money. As the market came back, we started seeing ransomware also uh, uh, increase again uh, as, as a money making mechanism. And make no mistake, the, 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 the bad guys are targeting us uh, as an industry because they know we have monetary uh, money that's moving uh, from point A to point B to, to fund loans and, and the bad guys are coming where the money is. <clears throat> and when you start talking about the, the monetization of these attacks, uh, the, the graph here that you see in front of you is uh, literally the, the type of malware. And so the malware, uh, itself, these are these are different uh, ransomware uh, packages that were were being sent around, <clears throat> and you know these are the, the payouts um, that the individual uh, companies paid out due to those ransomwares. And as, as you see, um, you know there's a couple of very high ones. Now this isn't necessarily specific to the mortgage industry, but these are specific incidents <clears throat> where um, the the FBI working with with CrowdStrike, that's who released this report, uh, you know, tied together the size of the ransom that was paid and the, the type of malware that was was being utilized. And so uh, as you look there, uh, there was a firm that paid uh, almost twelve and a half million dollars to get their systems back. Right? So these these are these are real funds that that companies are paying. And as the bad guys get paid, right, they're they're up in their game because it's, it's profitable for them. And when you look at all the threats that we faced in 2019 from a cybersecurity perspective, almost 40% of them were, were ransomware related, uh, which, which is you know, a, a very large number uh, in the grand scheme of all the different types of uh, cybersecurity issues that we have to deal with on a daily basis. <clears throat> so you know, when we look at the volume, right, it's, the, the reality of it is, is that, you know, ransomware uh, will, will impact uh, somebody in some shape or form almost uh, on, a, on a minute by minute basis. Um, when, you, when you start looking at uh, new victims per day, uh, a cybersecurity ventures group uh, did some research and found that a little over 6,000 new victims of ransomware occur every day. So that's not organizations as a whole, right? That's those are computers that are compromised. Um, but, but when you start thinking about that kind of volume, uh, that's tremendous. Uh, Webroot uh, also came out and said, hey, there's 50,000 new phishing campaigns generated on a daily basis. And so when you think about a phishing campaign, think of it how we run our marketing campaigns today as an organization. We gather a list of potential clients, right? We send either an email or some other marketing uh, item to those clients. And we're hoping for a certain percentage of those clients to click on our, our message. It's the same thing they're doing with these phishing campaigns. They're sending out 50,000 campaigns. They're hoping to have a, you know, four to 6% click through rate. And of that click through rate, they're, they're expecting an, an, another percentage of those folks to, to take the action that's not in their best interest, either install that software or visit the malicious website. <clears throat> and have that malicious payload downloaded. And what's interesting is that through 2019, nearly three quarters of the companies that were impacted with ransomware had up-to-date uh, antivirus in place. So antivirus isn't enough to, to combat this problem. Uh, there are other endpoint technologies that, that really set you up for success. Uh, many of them have forms of automation built in so that you can uh, limit the impact and exposure of, of those ransomware attacks, isolating those hosts automatically uh, so that it doesn't spread. Uh, and for about a third of those companies that were impacted last year, it took them a week or longer to regain access to their systems. And so when we start talking about the 21 
uh, companies that were impacted in the mortgage space, uh, many of them, it was 10 to 14 days, some even longer um, <clears throat> before they really started getting uh, back into full capacity. And a lot of that was uh, decisions either on did they pay or did they not pay? <clears throat> and there's no right or wrong answer there. Many organizations end up paying because they didn't, the, the, the backups they thought they had or the time it takes to restore those backups um, just weren't feasible. Uh, and when you start thinking about the different covenants that you have, the different commitments that you have to your borrowers, the, the, the timelines on what, what uh, loans are locked and, and things of that nature, the, the, the time it takes to recover from an incident like this is critical. <clears throat> and so you really should be uh, thinking about, uh, can I afford to be down a week or longer uh, when, when the market is, is, is hot as it is and is, is, is important as uh, some of the timelines and covenants that you, you have are. So uh, one of the case studies that I'd like to talk about today is uh, a, an incident that actually occurred just last month. It happened on the 28th of February. And what, what we had was uh, a, a mortgage lender uh, that we were actually doing a, a completely different type of engagement for. We were doing a maturity assessment for them and we had some of our sensors in, in their environment. And what we started noticing uh, around 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, their local time, is that the attackers had kicked off an attack. Uh, and we started seeing uh, endpoints get hit with ransomware. Um, because we had the sensors there, we were able to isolate those hosts and prevent um, those assets from being fully encrypted and prevent the attack. But the source of the attack was their IT service provider. And so they, they outsourced uh, a, a, a part of their um, management of their, their IT infrastructure to a third party. And this is a very common scenario for, for many of the lenders in the space. And, and that uh, IT service provider uh, installs uh, an endpoint management software uh, on those endpoints. And that, that software is designed for uh, remote support so that support people could log into the computer remotely, see the desktop, uh, make changes to the desktop, you know, troubleshoot issues with Encompass, things of that nature. Uh, it also uh, facilitates the ability to push software, right? Uh, updates, patches, things of that nature, things that we need to do uh, from a best practices perspective. These endpoint tools enable that from an automation perspective. The bad guys are starting to hack those companies because instead of convincing one or two or, or 50,000 people to click on a link, if they can compromise that IT service provider, they can actually utilize that, that, that software and push the ransomware out that way. And that's what they did in this instance. And as the ransomware was getting installed and, and revving up, you know, our sensors detected it uh, and we were able to, to isolate those hosts and automate the, the, uh, um, the qu uh, quarantining those, those infected assets and help remediate those. <clears throat> and why that's an important uh, piece to mention is that uh, in an organization, having a good incident response strategy and things of that nature, minutes count, right? Being able to, to automate these functions and things and stop uh, the, the spread of that software really does matter. And the, the bad guys, make no mistake, they purposely targeted the last day of the month, right? With the hope that they'd be able to ask for additional funds. And in the, in the environment we're in, uh, this particular lender had the best best month ever in their company's history, right? We've, we've got a very hot market going on right now. And so uh, downtime can be more, more expensive than, than anticipated. So how do we prevent some of these attacks and, and how do we react and, and reduce the overall impact to our organization? And, and I'm asked that a lot and, and the answer is, uh, out of my mouth is almost the same. Uh, first and foremost, it's always train your employees. Right? When we, when, as I mentioned before, phishing and, and other types of social engineering are is the number one way that many of these attacks start. And your employees are your 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 best first line of defense to see when something's, you know, just not right. Uh, hey, this looks a little suspicious, or this seems a little off, and and have them escalate that to your support teams or 
or uh, your, your cybersecurity resources because you want to be able to uh, understand what's going on in the environment and take action as fast as possible. Uh, as I mentioned before, <laughs> uh, consider adopting a managed EDR solution or an MDR solution. Those are the two terms that we, we hear out in the industry. And those, those solutions, uh, there, there are a number of different vendors out there and there's a number that we work with. Um, but the overall goal is that the difference between those tools and traditional antivirus is that they're designed to look at, at uh, malicious behavior, not necessarily just malicious files. And so by, by doing that behavioral analysis, uh, it enables the software to have uh, automation built in and isolate hosts and do remediation. And again, when, when you're dealing with an incident such as ransomware, um, minutes matter on how impactful those, those uh, compromises can be. And so having a tool like this that will take some automation, isolate the host, and help you with the remediation really can save you uh, a tremendous amount of time and money uh, down the line. The third piece is you, you need to develop, and I can't emphasize this enough, test a comprehensive incident response plan. <clears throat> and you know, it, it's not as just simple saying, hey, we had a plan, we've got enough to, to check a box and hand it over to the state or federal regulator or the GSEs and uh, meet our requirements from that perspective. This is something you should be testing periodically, at least annually. Do a tabletop exercise, take into, a scenario, uh, take into account a scenario like a ransomware incident. How would you respond? How would the, who would the employees contact? <clears throat> if we had a dozen or so employees impacted, uh, do we have enough uh, computers to redeploy to them? Do we have an option to get them uh, back up and uh, functional? Uh, if, <clears throat> if we don't have the hardware, are we sending you know, our IT staff out to Best Buy to buy uh, 10 or 12 laptops? What, you know, those are the types of things you should be walking through in those instant response plans. And, and don't be afraid if your checklist doesn't check all the boxes. The, the, the goal of the test is to identify where there's some weak points so you can build processes into that plan uh, to be ready when an incident occurs. You don't want to be figuring this out when, the, the, as the minutes pass, uh, you're, you're losing not only revenue, but you're incurring additional costs from a remediation perspective. Uh, you know, many of you have and have leveraged or continue to leverage uh, things like Office 365, G Suite, Mimecast, uh, you know, Proofpoint. There's a lot of different tools out there, but make sure that you're scanning your email attachments for malware. Again, uh, and, and, and if the tool allows it, also malicious uh, links. Because what you want to, uh, as I mentioned before, that these phishing emails come in, and if we're preventing or at least flagging suspicious activity so, the, so your employees know, hey, this seems a little off. Hey, this email's from an external organization. Maybe I shouldn't open this attachment. I wasn't expecting it. Or maybe I shouldn't click this link. Um, and so having that level of automation to either prevent the delivery or at least flag that content is really important. Um, and then lastly, uh, think about having cybersecurity insurance uh, uh, to, to help with ransomware. So uh, many of you may have insurance today, um, but it, it is really important to check your policy and make sure you have coverage for you know, social engineering attacks, ransomware attacks, things of that nature, because not all policies are created the same and, and the, 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 the policy coverages are different, the, limited, the, the limits are uh, different. But the other piece that's also important to, to understand is <clears throat> when do you need to get your insurance broker involved? Because uh, each one of those coverages have specific triggers in them and that should be built into your incident response plan as well. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about the incident response plan in detail. Some, some interesting stats that I'd like to talk about though is that uh, there was a survey done by Cisco Systems, the, the global networking company based out of San Jose, California. And you know, nearly three quarters of the companies they talked to actually didn't even have an updated incident response or disaster recovery strategy. Uh, and that's, that's a staggering number in my opinion. <clears throat> 
um, especially in today's day and age, not just with ransomware, but when we start talking about business continuity with some of the other things that are going on um, in today's environment, uh, these, these plans are even more critical. Um, and I, I can't emphasize in this enough, having a comprehensive plan is, is, is going to reduce your downtime. And it's not just reducing downtime from a business operations perspective, but the longer that you're down, the more costly remediation is gonna be. Um, make sure that you're considering to contact the FBI early in your process. The FBI, uh, as I mentioned, the IC3 task force, uh, they're investing a tremendous amount of time, money, and resource into monitoring the ransomware threat. And many of these ransomware attacks, as, you, as, as I've previously shown on some of those other slides, uh, they're, they're part of a common um, family of attacks, right? And, and they're, they're collecting the keys and statistics around uh, the bad guys and their uh, ransomware attacks. So they may actually have the decryption keys already. Uh, and, I, and I don't mean that that's a surefire thing, but, but it is a good idea to get them involved early in your process so that you can potentially leverage uh, the knowledge and or uh, encryption keys that they may already have. Uh, identify a partner to aid in your remediation. Now, uh, have that part of your plan and have them on retainer or at least have the contracts out of the way. There's nothing worse than you know, your house is burning down and then you're you're trying to, to, to broker a relationship with the firefighters um, before they show up. Uh, it, identifying a firm that can help you with you know, the remediation of your cybersecurity incident, as well as help with the recovery, uh, again, can help uh, save you valuable minutes uh, when, when your whole entire organization is down. And again, don't forget to test your plan. Uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, just having the plan documented it isn't enough. You have to walk through the plan with specific scenarios in mind uh, for it to be effective. Uh, some other things in, in relation to being able to prevent uh, some of these attacks is think about configuring controls that you already own. Many of our tools already have some things that we could leverage to reduce uh, the risk and the impact of these um, ransomware attacks. The first one is blocking macros. Now I know a lot of your uh, finance folks love to use Excel documents and, and uh, there's some real Excel wizards out there that, that embed my macros and, and do a lot of uh, interesting workflow things there, but, but you really should shut that feature off um, to help limit the impact uh, of malicious Word documents and Excel files that are sent in to your organization. Um, as I mentioned before, leverage your email platforms to filter uh, on, on dangerous uh, file types. And typically these platforms have uh, pre-built uh, filters to, to, to filter out dangerous file types such as executables uh, and, and, and other types of, of uh, code execution. Uh, the other one is by default, uh, Windows uh, no longer has file extensions on, and again, that's just from a, a uh, end user uh, user experience perspective, but we highly recommend you make sure that through uh, either uh, group policy objects or, or some other configuration tools, you know, turn file extensions back on. That way, folks really do know if it's a PDF that they're opening or, and not, um, you know, click on me.pdf.exe, for example. Uh, another one that that you know many of of, of the uh, security practitioners out there talk about is, is configure your windows open with to always point to notepad. So notepad it, it will only open the file to, to make it look, and, and even if it's a binary, it won't execute the file. And so um, while this can be some, somewhat inconvenient for your users, if you have a large volume of files flowing through your environment and you're seeing uh, a, a lot of uh, incidents of people clicking on malicious files. This is a good recommendation to implement to help um, reduce the risk from that. <clears throat> uh, again, uh, you know, consider disabling Windows Script Host. And so depending on how you're doing some of your automation uh, to manage uh, your distributed workforce, uh, this, this may or may not impact you. But again, another area where we're seeing the bad guys leverage uh, automation and tools uh, for their benefit uh, if you're not utilizing 
uh, Windows Script Host to, to do automation in your environment, you should shut it off. This, this other bullet, and this one's probably not a very popular topic in many organizations, but it really does move the needle from a risk perspective, is you should consider removing local admin rights from the endpoints. Uh, you know, the, more often than not, uh, many of these um, malicious uh, pieces of software that come into our organizations uh, leverage <coughs> um, administrator permissions to install or, or change and, and reconfigure the, the, the endpoint. And so if the user uh, themselves don't have the, uh, those permissions, the software itself will, will, will most likely not have that permission as well. And so it's really important uh, you consider adopting that. Uh, this is in many organizations that we initially walk into, this is one of the, the first findings that we find is that you know, all the users have local admin rights uh, and we can really reduce the risks by shutting that off. Um, again, for those of you, uh, and, and you guys should all be on Windows 10 now since Windows 7 is now end of life, but consider using Microsoft's App Locker uh, to, to block specific file extensions as well. So Microsoft has got a number of different security features built into Windows 10. App Locker is one of them uh, that you can leverage. Um, again, these are tools that you already own. It's just configuring them uh, for your environment. Uh, and again, work with your IT folks or, uh, and your business partners to make sure that it doesn't have a direct negative consequence. Um, some of the things will have some, some process changes that you have to consider adopting, such as the removal of local admin rights. Um, but but that, that really does help reduce your overall risk. So let's talk about having a good backup. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, many of the incidents that have occurred, um, you know, the folks ended up paying the ransom because either their backups took longer to restore than they anticipated, um, or their backups were no longer uh, viable to utilize. Um, uh, on that, that latter part, on the viability, you know, really consider adopting air-gapped backups, meaning that you're taking a backup and you're storing it offline. Um, because in some of these attacks, what we're seeing is the, the, the malicious actors will come in, <clears throat> uh, compromise an asset or two, and then they'll start targeting the backups. And the reason being is they know if, if you figure out you don't have a good backup, the odds of you paying uh, dramatically increase. And so if you're keeping those back up, backups offline where um, the bad guys can't identify where they're at, uh, it, is, it, it, it goes a long way in preventing them being able to cor corrupt those backups. Um, <clears throat> in relation to your backups being viable and understanding how long it takes to restore your environment, uh, you really should review <clears throat> and test your backup procedures. And, and some organizations do full backups on a nightly basis. Some folks do incremental with a full backup once a week or twice a week, or, and, and it, it varies. But you really should review that and make sure that when you go to do a test restore, that you're recovering your environment in a timely fashion, that your, your backup uh, strategy and procedures are structured in a way that you can pick and choose assets based on their importance um, and be able to get your critical systems up uh, and restored first uh, with your, your critical uh, network shares. Uh, and then everything else can be uh, on a slower timetable. But if you just have one backup to rule them all, it's a, it's a lot harder to restore on a timely basis. Um, and it's really critical as you start looking at where you want to invest your dollars and how uh, you structure your, your, your criticality for your different systems is understanding how long it takes to restore uh, those systems uh, and, and restoring one system versus 12 systems versus 20 systems, those timelines uh, can get staggering uh, and, and really be uh, impactful. Um, so <laughs> this, this graph here, I, I, I borrow this from um, another partner of ours, uh, Red Canary. They took a lot of these different recommendations and they put them on, on a grid based on level of effort. <clears throat> and so when you look at some of the different things where um, you know the level of effort to, to actually physically do it, is low, like removing local admin rights, that, that's just a couple clicks. Um, the impact is high, but understand that, that you know, there, there's obviously some, some uh, potential business process impact and things of that nature um, by, by doing that. <clears throat> but when you start talking about 
offline backups, uh, you may have to change your entire backup strategy. Uh, you may have to update your procedures. You may have to find new uh, software and service providers. And so um, the, the ease might be you know, high, but the impact is also high. So these are, these are the kind of things that you want to look at uh, in, in, as you're, you're uh, maybe considering what you might work on in, in the next quarter or so from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, you know, this, this can help kind of guide you on how much effort and how, how big of an impact these changes might be. So uh, changing gears a little bit and talking about phishing. So as we um, you know, talked about ransomware uh, and, and the phishing being the tip of the spear, uh, I think everybody's familiar with what phishing is, but in, in a way it, it really is just a fraudulent attempt to make you take an action that's not in your best interest. And it could be sending you an email that's disguised as uh, uh, an HR link to update your 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 uh, tax information, <laughs> or it could be there's there uh, you know uh, an, e an email saying, "Hey, I'm at a conference right now, and I need you to go out and buy some gift cards." Right? The the, the variety of these attacks uh, vary greatly, um, and <laughs> when we started seeing these attacks uh, well over a decade ago, it was very easy to to, to identify. English was bad. <laughs> the look and feel was was really hokey, um, and and it was it really almost seemed to be a caricature of what a legitimate email would look like. You fast forward to today, there's entire phishing platforms designed with uh, uh, marketing like precision, where you put in your 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 uh, email lists, you pick the templates that you want to utilize. Those templates have stolen the look feel and logos of the, the companies they're trying to impersonate uh, all the way back to having a fake website with you know, functional logins so that, that when the users put their username and passwords in and click go, it's actually going to redirect you to the legitimate website and you'll never even know that they, they took your credentials. The, the, this technology has moved a very long way. And so uh, the bad guys are, are, are really good at using these tools um, <clears throat> to trick us. Um, and, and the stats show that. Um, when you start looking at um, you know, how, initial, uh, how companies are initially compromised, phishing by far and uh, a large, nearly over 80% of all the attacks um, are, are starting with phishing. Um, and they're not just taking your, your username and passwords. They're convincing you to install software like ransomware or backdoor, <clears throat> so they have persistence into your network. And the most common way is through weaponized Microsoft Word documents. And when you think about the workflow on how we operate our businesses, we're sending Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, and PDFs across, you, you, you know, not just our manufacturing processes, but with our borrowers and our customers. And, <clears throat> you know, so, in just inherently in our manufacturing process in the mortgage industry, um, we're ripe to be fished because of the way we do business. And the, the big thing here is that once we're compromised, that's not where it stops. The, the bad guys are really working to gather information about our companies. They're trying to figure out our size, our complexity, who are the key players from, from uh, you know, business decision maker perspective. Um, how can we work towards a monetized outcome? Because make no mistake, <clears throat> you're not uh, defending against uh, a couple teenagers working out of their basement. Um, these are, are professionally trained and organized individuals with the goal of, of making uh, money uh, at, at, at the root of what they do. This next graph, just to kind of show you uh, the volume, and this is actually from um, uh, uh, an actual client of ours, and this is from their uh, email gateway platform. But this just kind of shows you the types of uh, malware that's coming in. <clears throat> and uh, by far and large, the CX mail, that's a phishing email piece. Uh, and then you see uh, malwarefish-a, again, kind of a generic name, but about 67% of the malicious activity that's coming in is, is identified as, as phishing. And so just to really give you an idea of, of how 
big of an issue this is um, in, in an environment is, is you know, really what this was to um, message. So let's look at a couple of real world phishing examples. <clears throat> uh, and these are uh, actual uh, emails that, that have come through. And this one here, uh, again, just from uh, about two weeks ago, uh, was came into an organization uh, and the goal uh, of this was to look like their email gateway, right? Here it says it's powered by Moncast. View the message by clicking here. Uh, it, this information has been classified as sensitive and <clears throat> it came in from pre-purchase conditions. Uh, but what's interesting is that, that um, pre-purchase conditions, uh, when you highlight that 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 uh, link down here, the secure message from them, that's actually like a randomized uh, name at, at Gmail. But looking at this, it looks like a secure message that we would encourage our internal employees to utilize, right, when dealing with borrowers or third parties when we're sensing, sen sending sensitive uh, and PI data around. And so the bad guys know this and they're starting to, to tweak and, and um, tune their attacks to look like that. So uh, a couple of the other things that stuck out, uh, this was actually reported by an end user in that organization, is that <clears throat> while this isn't a live uh, fish and I can't do this demonstration live, but they, they highlighted over the clicking here <clears throat> and it didn't actually go to Mimecast at all. It actually went to, you know, typically when you're highlighting on the Mimecast side, they'll say, you know, US dash Mimecast protect in, in a, a, a string, but it looks like it's associated with Mimecast. It looks like it's associated with the company. Uh, this one went out to, I think like it, it was an automotive supplier or something was the domain name and it was like autoports.co.nz or something like that. So uh, the bad guys had set up a, a destination landing page that looked like the Mimecast portal at some auto, play, auto parts place that they could click on and then hopefully convince you to put your username and password in. Again, uh, thankfully the user, uh, we're, we're in this environment, we're trained to say, hey, this looks like a fish. They sent it in, <clears throat> we were able to find, uh, delete all of these from, from the rest of the email system and then block the sender. <clears throat> Here's another one. And, and this one's even more interesting is that, <clears throat> um, this came in as, as a, a digital invoice from Microsoft Office 365. Uh, so many of you guys uh, utilize this, to the, you know, the, the Office 365 suite of services. And again, the end user turned this in, which was great. Um, and there's a couple of giveaways here because you can see they were in a rush. So for instance, like the sign in with your O email account, um, instead of saying Office 365, they just put O. Um, <clears throat> the other piece, though, is that the end user is like, wait a second, why am I getting invoice.pdf? I don't pay invoices at my company. I'm not responsible for this. Um, and so they, they submitted that in. And, and what, what's interesting is that in the background, they're, they're trying to capture a username and password uh, again. But, but the reason they want these credentials is is again to, to utilize them for some other attack um, but they really did try to mimic the look and feel of uh, the mic one of the different microsoft uh, portals uh, but again there was just a couple of typos and again the user took into account i don't actually pay invoices here so why would i be getting an invoice email from from microsoft um, and so it's really important to train and educate our users on, on how to be proactive and, and limit their, uh, limit the impacts of some of these attacks. Um, you know, a case study we had here was, um, you know, we had a, a client and one of the personal admins within the company was receiving emails that appeared to come from uh, the company's executive. Uh, and again, it was the request to purchase some iTunes gift cards. Um, but on, on the surface, you're like, well, it seems like a pretty uh, simple thing to detect. And, and the, the admin actually pushed back and said, hey, um, really, why are you asking me for, for gift cards? And when, when that individual responded, that individual had their 
signature in the email, as many of us do automatically. And so what the bad guy quickly did was they took the, that individual's uh, cell phone number out of their email signature and started text messaging them. And that change in communication channel put that person at ease and they relaxed. Oh, I must know this person. They're sending me a text message on my cell phone. And then they went ahead and went forward with it. <clears throat> and that's, that's another way that we're seeing the bad guys um, you know, win here is that they're not just using email. They'll use email. And then when they get challenged or pushed back a little bit, but they know they have someone to interact with on the other end, they change the communication channel uh, to try to um, push you at ease and, and again, take actions that aren't in your best interest. And in this specific instance, um, the client lost a significant amount of money because the, the admin maxed out their corporate credit card um, and it was actually uh, called the controller asking for a limit increase, which is how they got tipped off that this happened. Um, another one here, and this is not mortgage industry specific, but financial services specific, was Voya Financial. And so they ended up uh, settling for uh, a little over a million bucks uh, with the SEC because they, they violated not just the red flags rule, but also the GLBA safeguards rule. <clears throat> and what was happening there is that back in 2016, uh, some bad guys were impersonating actual customers of Voya. Um, and, and requesting their passwords to be set. What was happening is that Voya wasn't actually validating that the, the person on the other end was an actual customer uh, with, with additional uh, validation questions such as, hey, what's your mother's maiden name, what's your birthday, you know, mailing address, things of that nature. <clears throat> and so the bad guys figured out that there was a hole in this process and within a six day period, they, they reset the passwords for um, about almost 6,000 customers, which enabled them to move funds, transfer money out, things of that nature. Uh, and, and so while Voya finally figured out what was going on, uh, a lot uh, of, of damage and impact was done, not just to Voya, but also their customers over, over that six day period. So how do we prevent these things and how should we be reacting? And the first and foremost, just as I mentioned with, with ransomware, so you need to train your employees, right? Make sure that they're educated on how to identify a phishing or social engineering attack. Um, <clears throat> you consider adopting a phishing platform so that you can test and train your employees. There's there's a many there's there's a number of these tools out there, uh, and and many of them are, are very cost effective, um, and and they come with many of them come with what they call a phishing button. This is a a, a, a plugin that you can push out to your employees. And it gives them a little phishing button in Outlook. And they, when they see a suspicious email, they can click that and that email can be routed to the appropriate support team so they can either investigate it, say, yep, it is a real fish. Let's see who else got it, block the sender. Um, when you see a, a massive phishing campaign going on, you can be proactive and educate your employees and say, hey, uh, please ignore this email. This is an actual um, you know, fraud attempt. Consider using SPF, DKIM, and DMARC uh, from an email security perspective. <clears throat> um, and these, these are our, our security protocols uh, designed to prevent domain spoofing of your organization. And this is mostly gonna help your, your borrowers, um, but it, it is still important to pre help protect your brand uh, to turn on some of these security protocols as it relates to your email domains. Um, and if you're, Current email platform or email security gateway supports this. Uh, tag your external emails. Bring additional attention to your employees that this email started from outside of the company, right? So that, that way they could be a little bit more diligent and, and add a little bit of additional scrutiny uh, to, to the email that's, that's showing up in their inbox. Um, so the, the last type of attack I want to uh, chat about uh, in the, in the time that we've got left here is business email compromise. And this is where it, it, the, the screen you saw before from the phishing campaign, a lot of the bad guys are taking your username and password so that they can take over your email account, either in Office 365 or G Suite, <clears throat> and conduct a scam uh, downstream from you, either with one of your customers or one of your, 
you know, uh, business partners. And really how this starts is that they identify a target uh, and they groom that target and they typically send phishing, uh, spear phishing emails. So those are phishing emails just targeted to one or two of those uh, individuals. Uh, once they've convinced that individual to give them, um, you know, their username and password, they're then sitting there and, and monitoring your inbox for uh, potential downstream business transactions that they could step in the middle of. Once they've done that, they step in and exchange information, and then they try to convince that person downstream to make a money uh, monetary wire transfer. And that wire transfer, uh, again, is, is really the, the end of, of, of the line, right? Many of these transfers that we're seeing, these funds wired directly overseas, and this is where you know, minutes matter and, and making sure that you have um, you know, the, the appropriate contacts at the FBI or some other organization uh, so that you can act on it is important. Um, <clears throat> just this month, the FBI InfraGuard released an alert that uh, business e email compromise is, is on the increase and to really be focused about it right now. And <clears throat> you know, interesting stat, from January of 2014 to October of last year, the FBI IC3 received uh, business email uh, compromise complaints uh, totaling a little over $2 billion. Uh, and those scams specifically target companies using Microsoft Office 365 and Google G Suite because your email, um, the, the email by default is, is accessible from, from anywhere uh, around the world. Uh, case study here, uh, we had a client who was experiencing an increase in wire fraud emails going out from uh, email accounts from their key executive leadership team. So uh, what the bad guys had done is they would identified that this company uh, had their Office 365 portal available uh, globally. It wasn't just uh, geotagged to, to be locked down to uh, the United States or North America. Uh, they, they then uh, went and downloaded uh, known uh, passwords for for you, uh, employees of that company. Uh, there's there's a number of, of different repositories of passwords on the internet. Uh, when a company like LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or you know take your pick, uh, Petco uh, ha has their their website hacked, the bad guys aren't necessarily wanting the content of the website itself. They're taking the username and passwords and and they're adding them to these vast repositories because people are known to reuse their passwords. And what had happened here is that the users in question were actually using the same password across all their both personal and professional accounts. And so the bad guys just, you know, basically guessed the right password based on these, these password dictionaries that have been created, gained access to those individuals Office 365 accounts and started watching business transactions for the last you know, 45 days and kept monitoring what was going on. <clears throat> and once they identified enough of, of, of the potential victims, they, they, they moved in and asked for wire transfers uh, from, from those downstream uh, business partners and clients. And, and the, this client wasn't notified of it until someone downstream questioned um, why the terms of the agreement was getting changed and called directly. And so we were able to at least step in, see uh, all the emails that went out and put a notice out to them to, to recall the funds. Uh, so that was a positive outcome to a potentially disastrous situation. So how do we prevent uh, business email compromise? Again, make sure we're training our employees to identify phishing and other social engineering attacks. Deploy multi-factor authentication. I can't say this enough. You know, the more we can move away from standard username and passwords into these one-time password tools, um, especially on anything that's externally accessible over the internet, it will help reduce our risk of the bad guys taking those platforms over. Um, again, consider using SPF, DKIM, and DMARC email domain security, tagging external emails so that uh, our employees are more inclined to, to focus on uh, this email is, is originating from outside of the company. Consider verifying all your payment changes and transactions in person or via telephone. So maybe we need to change our internal business processes on how we wire money, right? 
make sure that there's an, uh, an additional human uh, step, a human element into that. Uh, consider uh, utilizing geofencing to block access to your uh, email portals. Um, you know, Office 365 and G Suite will enable you to limit where uh, folks can log into your instances from outside of the country. Um, and you know, consider putting a global rule on for auto forwarding. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it really would behoove us to not allow email to automatically flow out of our corporate email to a non-corporate account, uh, not just because of business email compromise, but also think about as you're onboarding and offboarding branches uh, from, a, from a, a customer uh, contact and NPI perspective, you really want to be controlling that data. Um, this slide here is a little more in depth around SPF records. The piece I'd really like to touch on is there's a lot of different free tools out there. Proofpoint has one uh, enabling you to check uh, the, the different uh, security parameters in relation to what's going on with your email domain. Uh, so, so I encourage you to go out and look at um, how, how is your email uh, domain secure? Do you have the correct records in place? Because um, this really is important to um, protect your domain and how your customers identify with you. Um, and with that, we, we've got a few minutes left uh, and I'd love to open it up to uh, any questions that uh, anybody in the audience might have. Um, well, the first question is a pretty obvious one. Are we able to get a copy of the recorded webinar or a copy of the slides? Um, the answer to that is yes. We will be sending out both of those very shortly, um, you know, either tomorrow or the next day, probably. So we'll send those out. And again, you're definitely welcome to forward that on to anyone in your company who you think would benefit from this information. Um, while we're waiting for any other questions to come in, I actually had one. Um, which is of the things that you talked about that are, you know, such as enabling multi-factor authentication, is there anything anyone on the call could do now as an IT team that would either minimize disruption or not be that disruptive to help prevent any attacks um, or even just reduce the likelihood of an attack um, or respond to it quicker during this pretty critical time we're all going through? Well, that, that's a that's a great question, and the, there are a number of different things. I think the the first piece that I would I would highlight to everybody, especially as we're in a hypersensitive environment, and we have uh, we're moving into a realm of uh, distributed workforce, right? We're really moving people out of our physical uh, brick and mortar locations, uh, either because we're trying to be proactive or or our, our county and, and state governments are telling us we have to do that. And I think really making sure that you have multi-factor authentication and you have a good um, strategy around how you're enabling your employees to gain access to data is, is really going to be important. Uh, with a, a fast follower on making sure that your employees are educated and how you're going to communicate with them. Uh, make no mistake, the bad guys know that businesses are being massively disrupted by these quarantines, uh, and they are leveraging the fear around COVID-19, as well as this business disruption, to insert themselves into the conversation, uh, either through phishing or other means. And, and, and so really making sure that you're educating your employees. This is who's going to be uh, reaching out to you. This is when we're going to reach out to you next. And, and making sure that you're very clear on what those communications look like uh, so that the bad guys can't capitalize on this current situation, I think is, is, is going to be key. Awesome. Thank you for that. We had another question from Don. He asked, what is the recommended frequency for password changes? Well, that's a great question. Um, so uh, for, for many of you, um, the the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, they actually released a new guidance on this in 2019. And these, these, the, the password requirements traditionally have been you know, eight characters long, uh, you know, complex with up, upper and lower characters, numbers, things of that nature, and changed every 90 days. And what uh, the NIST, new NIST recommendations came back with is that uh, first and foremost, companies should really think about adopting one-time password or multi-factor authentication technologies. And 
the, the reason being is that folks are reusing passwords, folks are just you know taking password and adding a new number to increment it up. And, and so passwords really aren't uh, effective. Um, and it costs a lot to support people uh, when they change a the password and forget it. <laughs> and so that's their first part of the recommendations, adopt you know, a one-time password or multi-factor authentication strategy. In, in instances where you can't do that, either because the technology is limited, uh, because the app doesn't support it or, or, or whatever, um, they're highlighting that companies should adopt complex pass phrases of, uh, that, are, that are very long. So you're talking 18 to 24 characters in length, but changing that annually, right? So if you it, it really changing the dynamic of how you educate your employees, um, <clears throat> But, but first and foremost, we're really talking about consolidating on multi-factor, um, you know, looking at solutions like single sign-on, things of that nature, to really limit how many accounts employees have to, to deal with. Um, but, but that's really uh, the, the biggest uh, piece that, that uh, we're, we're seeing in relation to that recommendation. <laughs> awesome, thanks. And it sounds like it depends a lot on your technology. So. Um, you know, if you are thinking about upgrading or, or need advice for that, you know, JT is really experienced in, in helping that out. So, um, you know, let us know if you need any assistance with that. We have another question, um, which is from Jesse, and they ask, with VPNs being so common, does geofencing access to email portals still help? Great question. And, and you know, actually, it's funny that you mentioned the VPN piece because we're actually seeing a lot of clients question, uh, should we be using VPNs in, in given most of our platforms cloud hosted, right? And so um, that, 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 uh, that's definitely a case by case basis. But for, for, for organizations that do have, um, you know, are leveraging things like Office 365 and G Suite, uh, we we definitely do still recommend that because it's it's it, you have to think of it this way and this analogy is somewhat comical but but truthful in that if you and I are out hiking in, in the woods and let's just say we've got you know, a bunch of beef jerky in our back pockets and we come across a bear, uh, I don't have to be smarter than the bear or outrun the bear. I have to outrun you, and it's exactly what what you're doing there with the geotagging or geofencing piece in which that. Hey, look, I get it. I can use a VPN. I can make it look like I'm coming from the United States or the United Kingdom or you know South America or wherever in the world. Um, but that extra step of effort right now is enough to defer the bad guys to go on to the next company that hasn't bothered to do anything. And 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 to to really turn on that fencing capability is is such a low impact, easy easy configuration change for most organizations. Um, that, that's why we, we recommend that. Because again, yes, it's not 100% foolproof. Um, neither is running around the woods with beef jerky in your back pocket. But um, the, the, the point of the matter is, is that you only have to be as fast um, as the guy next to you so that the bad guys are attacking them and not you. So don't be low hanging fruit and JT will leave you behind in the woods if a bear attacks you. So um, <laughs> maybe don't go walking in the woods with JT after this uh, quarantine is over. So um, that was our last question that came in. Like I said, I will stick around for the next five to 10 minutes or so in case you ask any other questions. Feel free to reach out to us directly as well. Um, JT's email is up on the screen there, jt at richiemay.com, or you can email us at info at richiemay.com, um, and we will get back to you, um, you know, as, as quickly as we possibly can, usually within the same day. Um, we are going to have a couple of um, emails coming out soon about potentially a, um, you know, mortgage-focused uh, digital roundtable to talk about the current issues that are really pressing in the industry. So look out on an eye, keep an eye out for that um, invitation coming out from us. We're really making an effort to minimize everything down to mission critical communications right now, because we recognize this is kind of just an unprecedented time for everyone. Um, we'll be sending out the materials, like I said to you in the next day or so. And um, again, thank you. We really appreciate you attending and um, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks JT for the really great presentation. Thank you.